So it's just like, okay, let's just have a real talk, real talk, uh, no censorship. Welcome to BFP Roundtable, the new video podcast series from BoilingFrogsPost.com. I'm Peter B. Collins, and I'm host of the Processing Distortion Podcast and co-host of the Boiling Frogs Podcast here at BoilingFrogsPost.com. And I also deliver seven podcasts a week on news and politics at PeterBCollins.com. My co-hosts are James Corbett who produces the eye-opener video series for Boiling Frogs Post, and a wealth of audio and video reports at CorbettReport.com. Welcome, James. Thank you, Peter. Great to be here. And our third co-host is the one and only Sibel Edmonds, publisher of BoilingFrogsPost.com, co-host with me on the Boiling Frogs podcast, and the author of Classified Woman, the memoir of her experiences as a national security whistleblower. Welcome to you, Sibel. Good to be here, Peter. Now, this is our pilot show. Our aim in general is to share important stories that each of us has recently reported and add the views and knowledge of our colleagues here. Sibel, why don't you tell our viewers what your vision is for this new series? Well, uh, I have had this vision, and I believe it had been shared by, by our uh, partners here at Boiling Frogs Post for quite a while. In terms of having a show where we can discuss some of these important issues, but not in this under this interview format, but in some lively discussion where I don't have to, as I always put it in my articles, bite my tongue, and I don't have to try to be gracious. It's really hard for me. Uh, <laughs> it, it is. I will be civilized, but I cannot promise being gracious because that's one of the things you have to do. When you're a host, you have to be a gracious host. That's how I grew up, and that's how... It works for a really professional, good radio interview show. So it's just like, okay, let's just have a real talk, real talk, uh, no censorship. And if you want to get tough on some issues, let's get tough. If you want to be hard on some issues, let's get hard. And if you want to make some people angry, not because we want to make them angry, but because the issues may actually induce some anger, let's be it. Let's do it. So... Um, this is why we are having this uh, test show and we are going to explore various ways to make this a reality and have something that is thought provoking, you know, the critical thinking, that important aspect, but it's also exciting to watch and it also induces emotions because I don't want people like, okay, I'm, I'm listening to a lecture. I want people to participate with their emotions, get angry, get sad, get upset, get motivated and and also sometimes laugh because I think there's nothing wrong for us to be able to laugh when it comes to some of these really, really hard issues that you would think there's nothing funny. But sometimes when you look at it from different angles, you know, you are able to laugh. And I hope we can laugh together about these issues as well. <laughs> Good. James? I, I certainly hope we can do that. So um, I should just mention for those of uh, you out there who are watching this on my YouTube channel at the moment that this uh, series is based and has its home on the Boiling Frogs Post YouTube channel. And thanks to the magic of YouTube annotations, I'm going to put an annotation somewhere over here. And uh, you can just click on that to go over there and subscribe to that channel, not only for this report, but hopefully for other uh, video r reports in the future. Great. Well, I'm going to start off here and uh, reference a couple of recent stories that I've covered, and then I want to share with you uh, a, a story that broke last week that, that really deeply bothered me, and I'll explain why. So back on November 21st, I posted an interview with NSA whistleblowers Bill Binney and Russ Tice at PeterBCollins.com. They explained why NSA boss Keith Alexander recently admitted that he doesn't know how many classified documents Ed Snowden actually copied. And it's because NSA leaders decided way back there not to install audit systems in many NSA databases so they could do whatever they want and not be tracked like the rest of us are by the NSA. Also, last week I reported that Alexander had offered to resign last June, but the Obama administration rejected his offer. Now, recently, I interviewed appellate attorney John Eisenberg, who represents hunger-striking prisoners at Guantanamo, about the ethical and legal violations that arise from force-feeding hunger strikers. 
And in my most recent Processing Distortion podcast, I offered critical commentary on a recent 60 Minutes report about Gitmo, where reporter Leslie Stahl showed stunning ignorance. She didn't even know who Shakur Amr is, one of the best-known prisoners there, until he shouted at her from his cell while she was walking through the cell block with the warden. And she also stated, without any detail or proof, that a hundred former inmates of the 770-so who have been through Guantanamo, uh, quote-unquote, returned to the fight. Well, then we learned later in the week about Penny Lane, Penny Lane is an area inside the wire at Guantanamo, but outside of the uh, lockdown camps. And it's essentially a group of luxury apartments. And what we've learned is that the CIA took prisoners there, and they wined and dined them. Some of them were offered porn if they wanted to watch it, or their favorite movies. And they were then bribed to become double agents. And when they left Penny Lane, many of them were given, we think, millions of dollars and told to infiltrate Al-Qaeda and then report back to CIA minders. Now, we have no idea how many people were involved in this program, but clearly some of them went back to the fight or back to the battlefield at our behest. And so this is another piece of spycraft and, and what Dick Cheney called the dark side that the United States has been involved with. And on the one hand, 60 Minutes scares Americans by saying that a hundred uh, prisoners of, from Guantanamo have gone back to the fight. Some of them appeared in a video. <laughs> they didn't pick up arms. Uh, but then on the other hand, we learned that some of those people were intentionally sent back to the fight. And we have no idea if they did their duty as double agents or if they double-crossed the U.S., which is a typical uh, uh, situation with, uh, you know, these people who are really committed to their cause. So I, I just find all of this astounding. And once again, we have a corporate media that sits back and takes dictation from government sources. What are your comments? Well, if I may, first of all, let me just give kudos to you for that podcast. You did an excellent job, I think, dissecting that uh, that stall piece. And as one of the commenters on Boiling Frogs noted, it's almost like a People magazine piece or something. It was just really quite fluff. Um, quite quite disgusting to see that from supposedly one of the premier news organizations in, in the United States, uh, quote unquote. Um, but I think you give Leslie Stahl too much credit. I, I don't think she was actually ignorant of uh, Shocker Armor. I think it was just a, the, the type of um, uh, faking it that uh, that you do for a report in order to introduce the idea to the audience. I, 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 I think she was uh, fully aware of, of who he was and what was happening. It was just kind of that, that thing that you do to, to, uh, to kind of lead the audience into the, the story. But, a theatrical uh, device. That's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that, James. Well, that that's my take on it. But at, at, either way, I think it's pretty disgusting the way they presented it. And it really was like they were presenting it to a bunch of kindergartners. So it was it was quite insulting to my intelligence and probably to a lot the intelligence of a lot of the listeners out there. And Sabelle? No, no, I, I agree with James. Uh, I was interviewed by 60 Minutes in 2002. It was Ed Bradley. And Ed Bradley was just that. He was the person, the front there, who sat with me. And he seemed like a kind of a nice person. He seemed genuinely, it was not, I don't think it was an act, really interested. He did a very good job. I had a, about 90 minute session with him. And he did what he was supposed to do. He filmed, he knew, he had prepared the stuff. That was when his role was done. Then that film had to be sent to the edit room. And then you had the editors and then you had the management. And then you had CBS 60 Minutes own legal team because they have a big legal team. So they were the ones who sat there and decided which names to take out of that interview and how and um, you know in what way to really condense it and have that semi fluff piece that really made me look like this demure victim and I still end up being disappointment to a lot of people and, and, and again maybe we'll go back to it at the end of this show if we have time a lot of people and, and sometimes it even happens with my book they read it and they expect someone who is truly victimized <laughs> and very demure and they fired her and she's petite and she's so cute and she has this cute accent 
And that's basic. I got marriage offers, even though I've been married for 22 years. That's what CBS 60 Minutes accomplished. Now, they didn't lie, but what they did was they selected what they wanted to select and they put it out there. And I don't think Ed Bradley had anything to do, you know, with, with that process. And with well, this lady, I haven't had mainstream media channels since 2002. So I don't have CBS or any of those channels. I think she's like the rest of them. You have a group that are kind of bimbo or dumb. Or then you have these people who say, guess what? My bosses decide and my boss's bosses, they decide what's going to be aired. But it was well, a great show. It was an excellent show, Peter. A couple of things. One is that I did mention in the Processing Distortion podcast about your experience and other whistleblowers who tell a full story and then 60 Minutes selects just parts of it that pass muster with the lawyers, that don't exactly. offend the government too much, that won't limit their access in the future. And I worked for CBS in Chicago and in San Francisco, and I can tell you that the lawyers run that company. Uh, nothing happens without approval from the legal department. And the final comment is that uh, Laura Logan, and even though they have suspended her for the embarrassment of her uh, blundering report on Benghazi, uh, you know, she really epitomizes the beautiful woman who plays the role of a hard hitting investigating reporter on 60 Minutes. <laughs> Sabelle, let's turn to you next. What's been on your mind and on your agenda recently? Oh, so many things. So many things, Peter. And that's the whole thing. And I'm also going to watch to see if I'm, I get any signal because you know me. Once I start talking, I go yak, 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 and it goes on forever. But one of the most important issues that I have been uh, working on, reading and talking to people, both outside the country, for example, in Iran, and also here, has to do with Iran and what has been happening with Iran. And it's really amazing for me because based on what I get from people there and um, based on what I myself, you know, research and analyze and find <laughs> and read about and then what I get both from the mainstream media and alternative media here in the United States but also all over Europe, there is this huge discrepancy. And, and, uh, and again, it's really amazing even with a lot of anti-war activists, you know, people that, you know, we associate with and great, you know, knowledgeable people, they are basically reacting or responding to all these headlines and what is being told in the on the mainstream media and all these different think tanks, the way they are being told to respond. You know, basically, we, what we have here in the front is we have this president, President Obama and this administration trying so hard to have peace with uh, Iran, to not have sanctions, you know, and to be civilized. And, and they are fighting the Israel lobby for it. Man, they are fighting so hard, you know. I don't think any president has done it, but he is that kind of a president. All of a sudden, six years later, something happened. You know, there is this thing in the religion Islam that Muhammad went to the cave, spent six, seven hours there, and he didn't know how to read and write. He was illiterate, uh, okay? And he came down the mountain from the cave, and he could read and write. He went there, and some revelations happened. You know, some, some miracle took place there, and I'm not going to insult any religion or anything, but I believe unless something like that happened to President Obama, people have to look and see what kind of smoke we are talking about here because... This is exactly the same man who has been droning the hell out of Pakistan, Libya, Egypt, and Syria, okay? And now suddenly he is opposing the Congress, the Democratic base, and the Israel lobby. He wants to make peace with Iran, okay? And people really need to look at it in a really simplified way first because nothing is really simple, but a lot of things are simple, okay? Put yourself in the position of the administration, in the position of President Obama. You have had some big time boo-boo, okay? Egg in your face. Disastrous results from Egypt happening, right? And Syria, oh my God, talk about embarrassment. Look what happened with Syria. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have been working with these people, Rice and all these people, and you say, uh-oh, it's time to bring the old guys back. So you bring either Kissinger or Brzezinski and say, how the 
how am I going to get out of this crap? What am I going to do? You guys tell me. And they say, you need to go at this through the back door. That's what they've always done. That is the grand chess game and how you sneakily do what you want to do, which is being the hawk, have the war with Iran. So what kind of things would you do? Let's say now put yourself in President Obama's position, okay? Uh, and, and put yourself in the hawk's position. What would you like to see? You would like to see some kind of unrest in Iran. That's one way to look at it, okay? Because who leaked the fact that there has been these secret meetings between the United States and Iranian, you know, president and the, the administration there? It's, it's the administration who has been reporting this secret. If it's secret, you know, they would be right now going to court, you know, like James Risen and, and Snowden. Who the hell leaked these important things? We are trying oh, to make you, peace you here. You know, offic official leaks are okay. Absolutely. But who officially wanted this? The administration and the mainstream media is reporting it, correct? And when the mainstream media later went and they pressed, they pressed the White House, the White House confirms it. Now, look what's happening with Iranian sites. You are listening and you are hearing and you're watching the Iranian president and saying, no way, no, 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 no. We haven't had any secret meetings because in Iran, not only with hardliners, I am quarter Iranian. I live there and I'm in touch with Iranians. Even with the progressives there who want regime change, okay, they don't want a president, an administration that is having secret la 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 talk with some kabusi emperor or king, wherever he is, and making deals, okay? That is unacceptable, whether it is for the hardliner or the, the, the progressives, okay? So you are putting the Iranian administration in this really awful position. And I tell you what, based on my information from people I've been talking with, there are some people who are even looking into assassinating the current president, okay? He's a traitor, okay? That's what the Iranian public see, even the ones who are not hawkish, who are not hardliners. So that's, that may be one thing they want to accomplish. You bring that kind of unrest there. Let's say the president gets assassinated, and let's say the more hardliners come in power, then we're going to say, see, these people are in charge. We, we tried, okay? But these people are not the kind of people we can negotiate with. We're going to go in there. So that's one way the jerks like Kissinger's, their mind works. It has worked like that. Actually, it comes from the British Empire. That is more British than American. It's kind of more sound, it's smarter. Somehow he has that kind of a revelation, President Obama. Or B, set it up in such a way with all the negotiations and everything and set up the whole scene and set them up to fail and say, we the good guys, we tried, man. We tried so hard to prevent war. They didn't leave any other options for us. Does Israel notice? Of course. But they have to play their role in this. So if it's Brzezinski or most likely Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger is going to say, meanwhile, you, Israel, you're going to hate this. You're going to scream the loudest about it. You're going to say, I'm not going to support you, Obama. It's horrible. They have to. In order for it to be believable, they have to. Yet... Outside one website the other day, and that's Tony Cartolucci's Land Destroyer, nobody has been looking at what we are seeing here with Iran from these different angles. Everybody has been parodying. We have had Muhammad moment with President Obama. He went somewhere in some kind of a retreat or something. Some revelations came to him. Hallelujah, you have President Obama, a change man. That's the story the alternative media is telling us. That's the story the mainstream media wants you to believe. And that's the story that is concocted by the establishment, by the same administration. And unfortunately, my blood is boiling here, has been boiling because I feel like here I am again, outside very, very few handful of people, we are having that lone voice moment for Sabal Edmonds. Go ahead, please. Well, Sibel, I'm hearing two forms of criticism from uh, kind of extreme ends about this proposed interim deal with Iran. One comes from some leftist Americans, and Gareth Porter is, is one of these sources. And he analyzes this and thinks that this is theater and that um, Obama wants to go through the motions 
uh, as a peacemaker here, as, as you're suggesting. The other extreme I heard from a right-wing radio show who is, was reporting that um, the news media in Iran uh, have said that this deal enables Iran to move forward to develop uh, a nuclear capability. And so that's what is being pushed out to the right wing in the United States. But for me, the fundamental is that that has not changed is that there is a broad and I think misplaced uh, sentiment in the United States among our elected officials that regime change in Iran is in the best interests of the United States and that this is really just a stepping stone to that. I, I, I'm going to have to agree. I think that um, in some way this is a setup to fail type agreement. And I, I think that further down the road, if not even the Obama administration, but, uh, but whatever, you know, right wing administration or whatever gets into power, neocons or hawks get into power at some point, we'll be able to use this to, to say that this was violated in some way as the excuse towards that uh, furthering of the regime change agenda. So I, I think that there, it, there's definitely something underneath the surface here. This isn't a straightforward narrative of peace and happiness, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm certainly keeping my eye on Israel in this because obviously the um, the the way that they react to this is going to t uh, tell a lot about the way that this will be accepted or not, and and my money unfortunately on the long term is that this will will fall apart at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I I think you know the prospects are very strong in in that direction, and this is the script that even though Israel is acting. Uh, offended and working to, uh, you know, activate APAC and all the allies in the United States that, about this awful, awful deal, uh, I do think that most of that is posturing and uh, that there is a desire, you know, on, on most parts of the P5 plus one to go through the motions looking for a pretext to go forward with an attack on Iran or with covert ops to uh, destabilize or change the government. Agreed. No, absolutely. And, and we are seeing this, but as I said, out there currently we are having this uh, from, the, from the opposite uh, party, from the Republicans, that how he's doing it and making a pact with evil. Of course, you can't trust Iranians and everything. From the left, what I hear, you know, he's a, he's a man of peace. Now you see he deserved that Nobel Peace Prize. You see that? You guys were all jumping in judgment. So what he killed millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people? Who, so what if he went and waged declared or undeclared war six, seven, or eight, or ten times and a bunch of covert wars around? In the end, he's showing the real peace man he is. And uh, this is why you have to vote Democrats. <laughs> Two years down the road, vote Democrat because they may spend seven years killing, but in the end, in the end, they do see the light. But the big bad Republicans never do. Go ahead, <laughs> please. All right. Well, now let's shift to James. And James, you recently went to France to a conference. Tell us about this. That's right. So uh, hopefully my listeners know by now, but for those out there who don't, I was recently in Lille, France um, to attend a conference that was put on by INRIA, which is a, a technical institute, a research institute there in France. They have several locations, one of which is in Lille. And every year they put on an open source software conference called FOSA. So I was attending FOSA 2013 as a uh, guest speaker. Um, and I was delivering a keynote address on open source journalism. This is uh, the fascinating part of this FOSA conference. Um, open source software, of course, is, is something that I'm sure many people are familiar with. The idea that uh, there's uh, software that's, that's made so that the code is open and, uh, and people can, can uh, work on it and offer suggestions for changes and can, can become part of a community of users rather than simply re sort of recipients of, of a piece of software. They can become actively a part of the community creating that software. It's a, it, it's a, a, a really a, a quite a revolutionary way of looking at how to create a, a product in, uh, and, and really goes against the ways that, uh, of course, we've, we've uh, come to understand the, the manufacture and, and, uh, and selling of, of products um, in, in, uh, in our everyday life. So it is, uh, it, it's a very interesting thing, but it's usually confined to that box of talking about software and talking about code. But FOSA is, uh, every 
every year trying to expand the definition and trying to expand the way that people look at the idea of open source and open source communities. So this year they had some speakers talking about open source art. Uh, they had Tom Secker there, my uh, my friend and someone that I've interviewed many times, uh, talking about open source intelligence. And I was there talking about open source journalism. So, uh, so it was a really interesting conference, a lot of mixture of ideas, lots of really interesting and innovative uh, uh, sort of projects that people are working on that I, I heard about. Of course, I highlighted um, Jan Vildeboer and his work on uh, free identity um, uh, in the eye opener this week. So that that was an interesting thing I learned about. Also, open source vehicle. They're building a, a car that's completely open source. You can download the uh, the blueprint and and manufacture it yourself. Um, in fact, they've even put it together in 41 minutes using two people um, before. That's their record. So it's just, I mean, it's just fascinating the things that are going on. But something that struck me while I was there and and being part of this was a sort of a renewing of my own sense of open source um, as an important fundamental tenet of the work that I'm doing. And and I'm sure people um, who follow my work know that I do make all of my content freely available. I also um, uh, make it so that uh, there's always a documentation list. I always try to cite all the sources that I that I talk about because that's a fundamental part of the project that I'm doing. I'm, I'm not here on high delivering any sort of message um, from the clouds. I'm here as part of a conversation, what I view as a conversation. And I don't view my listeners as passive receptacles. I think that they're, they're an active part of the community that hopefully will start to further the uh, the information itself and, and our understanding of it. But on that note, um, this BFP roundtable is supposed to bring up some controversial subjects. So um, today I wanted to really press this issue about open source because this is really, this conference has really renewed my, my commitment to that. And uh, it's something that I've always thought about with regards to, to Boiling Frog's post and my work with the Eye Opener report and the fact that this is um, this is not open to everyone for the first three weeks of the Eye Opener report. And I understand why you do this because obviously you are running a site where you ha- now have several contributors, um, absolutely top class quality contributors like Peter and Guillermo and uh, Andrew Gavin Marshall and just everyone at the Boiling Frog's post site putting out just incredible work and you want to keep this going. And how do we do this without money? Um, that's the always the, the million dollar question. Um, and, and so what I am going to propose right here on air, I am going to say that uh, uh, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I am willing to do the eye opener report 100% for free. I don't want to accept a cent from Boiling Frog's post if we make it 100% open on YouTube. I think that's a, that's a great proposal. And I think this is another opportunity to see, I mean, this is very similar to the, you know, the, what you said, the crowdsourcing and, and try trying everything we can to offer top notch, top quality shows, whether it's podcast shows or videos or articles or investigative reports and have people do it voluntarily. And this is a good opportunity for me to actually go on record here and say, that's exactly what I tried to do for two and a half, three years. This website was saying, okay, all contributions are voluntary, okay? And you basically, do you enjoy this? You come and visit. Do you believe this is a worthwhile cause, what we are reporting or what we are bringing to you? And if yes, do make your contribution, whether it's a $5 contribution, whether it's $1,000 contribution, because we take this and then we share it with people who are spending the time because it does take time and 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 we'll make it free to all. And I came every three months out there begging people and it's not begging for me, it's begging for all of us at Boiling Frog's Post to say, support us, contribute, Do please do your share, however little it is, if you can. There are some people who really, really can, but I don't believe most people are in that position or even half of those people are in that position. So, but it did not become successful. But not only that, it, we didn't even raise one, I would say 10% of what we were looking for. So that was when I had to stop and say, I either go and get a full-time job, okay? And this is what I was doing, contract translation work. And I, I won't do this. Or I do it part-time and get a part-time contract job and then see if I can convince our other partners to do that. Well, that didn't go a long way either because I know currently some people who can really do a lot of great work, 
but unfortunately they have to commute one and a half, two hours a day. They have to spend eight hours time at work. They come home and guess what? They have spouses, they have children or a child and they have their own health issues. So we are not looking these people who don't have marriage and children. We have to eat, we have to have roof over our head. Well, it has to come from somewhere. So the choice for me was not whether I offer it, we offer it for free or we do a subscription. It, the choice was, do we offer it to people or not? Because either they have to go and work and eat and there won't be time to produce this quality stuff. So that was one reason we went subscription. And the other important reason is some people may consider us ambitious, but we have been expanding. We started with one great podcast show with Peter. He was one of the first people, actually. He was the first person who came on board. And it was, for me, amazing. It was very humbling because this was Peter B. Collins. And back then I had, uh, whatever, one, two, three, real chain, blog post, that's called blogspot.com. <laughs> so anyhow, it was, it was a really humbling thing because when I proposed, I was like, he's going to say, who do you think you are? I'm Peter B. I've been doing this for 25 years. Anyhow. And then we added video and then more podcasts, editorial cartoons, etc. But that's not it. I want to have, for us, Spoiling Frogs Post, I want to have solid investigative reporters. I want people on the ground in Afghanistan. There was a report about this uh, toddler girl who was killed by Obama's drone, by our government's drone. There are, there's no picture of it, okay? I want a picture of that. Because we saw those pictures during the Vietnam War, and those were effective. We don't get to see those pictures. We don't get to see the pictures of drone victims, or maybe a few of those pop up in some alternative sites. We don't have a way to establish, is it real? Is it authentic? Sometimes I'm afraid to put it out there, because somebody's going to say, maybe it's fake. So I have to be able to rely on that. I want to have for us photographers on the ground and compensate those people and get those photographs. I want to have our own investigative reporters. There are so many scandals. I get so many emails from people who want to be whistleblowers, or they are, but I don't have the time single-handedly to vet them to cover those. Well, how can I get some people that I trust? Sure, I get emails from people who say, I would like to volunteer, but I'm like, huh, is he Mossad or is he CIA? <laughs> Or is he a cook who wants to come and penetrate my website? They may, they may, I bet most of these people are well-intentioned people, like with open sourcing, but I am so freaked out and so paranoid when it comes to our site. I haven't let anyone inside this website except three people because I'm like, oh, you never know. Therefore, to have those stuff, we really need to have not only resources, but dependable resources. If I go and tell Mr. X, quit your job, come and work with us, with us, for us, boiling frogs pose for the people, and I will compensate you, and he does quit his job, and he or she has a spouse and children, and three months later I say, oops, we were not able to raise this amount, therefore I can't pay you. I can't take a chance with people's life. I'm sorry. Maybe some people are willing to do that. I can't. This is the reason for subscription. I hate dealing with this software. I hate having it. I want to have 150,000 people watching Corbett show or listening to Peter B. Collins. I want 1,500,000. I want 150 million. I don't want only three or 4,000 people, but it takes two. It takes us and it takes you. And as when we get that, if you put some kind of a measure out there, say, okay, we reached that, that's crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. If we get that, that's if we are set for a year so we can promise these people and deliver, then absolutely everything will be free at Boiling Frogs Post. We haven't been at that point. Peter. Well, let me add a few things because I've been running my podcast for four years and it, it's difficult. It's difficult to keep it viable and to cover my expenses. Uh, I don't get paid uh, really more than 12 cents an hour for the podcasts that I do. And I support myself by working as a media consultant. So I'm able to make that work. And so at my site, I have kind of split the, uh, the model. And I release in-depth interviews only to subscribers for the first two weeks but I do a daily news and comment podcast that is always free. And so I am working both sides of the street, James, to try to find the sweet spot. Uh, and to me, 
Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with reader-supported news, but Mark Ash, who had previously run truthout.org, has that service. And he goes to a low point uh, in his fundraising drives where he kind of acts like they're about to pull the plug, they're about to go out of business, uh, and he, he shames people into supporting the work. I, I don't believe in that. I try to use uh, an inclusive model by thanking the people who help me uh, and hope that other people say, oh, I could do that too. Uh, but I did find when I was purely on a voluntary basis that people just don't find that compelling. And not everybody will respond to the offer to voluntarily support an effort like this. So uh, I appreciate the challenge. I also respect, James, uh, your position, and I hope that long term that is viable. Uh, but in the meantime, I do think Sabelle has important points there that she's made commitments to people to pay them for quality work, and that's what makes the site valuable and brings people to read it. And so I think this is one way to educate our listeners and viewers uh, about the choices that we make. And we all, I, I think it's very clear, we'd all prefer to never have to use subscriptions or, or cordon off content with a paywall. Uh, but we are trying to find our way also without taking foundation money or corporate sponsorship. I don't run Google Ads on my site. I could make a few hundred bucks a month doing that if I did, but I, I would end up having uh, ugly ads for things that I don't approve of on my site. And so the, these are the ways we try to navigate in this uh, wild, wild new world. Well, I, I hear what both of you are saying, and I, that's why I don't think that this is a decision that I could make for anyone else. But I think for myself personally, I'm going to um, put the, my money where my mouth is, and, uh, and it is a grand experiment. And I have a roof to keep over my head and food to keep on my child's table, so it is perhaps reckless and wanton of me to do this. But I am willing to donate my time to Boiling Frogs in order to make this happen, because I do feel strongly and passionately about this. And I have been blessed with a listening audience that does support me to a large extent with uh, subscriptions, um, for which basically all they get is a newsletter. So it isn't uh, it isn't much that I actually provide for that, and, and I am absolutely blessed to be in that position to have listeners like that. So I want to, to try to give back whatever I can to those people and, uh, and to ask them to support Boiling Frog's post, um, not because they are going to get something out of it um, in, the, in the content sense, but because uh, they, they actually enjoy the, 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 the information and they actually appreciate what's coming out of there. So I'm, I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is, and if, uh, if you approve, I will donate my time to Boiling Frogs in order to keep the eye-opener open. Absolutely, and I think, I think that's fantastic. I wish we could have more opportunities like that, but as you said, the other very important point that I'm going to briefly mention is the difference between, and, and I have been saying that, you know, Peter mentioned this about having all these different people that you can say, you know, you can go quit your work and, and come and do this stuff. This is more important considering where we are with the country. Uh, whenever I go, and whether it's a little lecture series or a book club or the, or the speech, etc., people, people are like, where should I go? to get my news for alternative media. And it's such a difficult question to answer because I'm doing this nightly news for Boiling Frogs Post five nights a week. It takes me three to four hours to collect the reliable. So, and I go to over 50 websites, 50 to 100 websites to collect those, okay? I know there are two, three semi to very reliable sites for Central Asia Caucasus news, I go to those for that news. For police state related uh, issues, I go to certain websites. So I go for econ related issues, financial news. I so, But I know 99.9% .9 of people don't have that time. They can't go and spend three, four hours. So they come to me and they say, tell us where to go. And they would freak out, completely freak out if I were to give them the list of 50 to 100 websites I'm going to. This is another reason I said, well, I want for Boiling Frogs Post to be this place where you get all this great aggregated news that have been vetted out, you know, for not being fluff or the partisan message, etc. You get five, six, seven great podcast shows from different philosophical points 
different political stand, whether it's libertarian leaning or left leaning or right leaning, have that to have great investigative video reports, editorial cartoons, commentaries, ed all those things. So at least I can tell people maybe they can go to two or three websites because how many people can spend four hours navigate the site, research? They want easy answer. This I'm not saying boiling frogs post. It is currently I'm aiming to be maybe one of very few sites that those people who don't want foundations, they don't want Omid Yar backed eBay corporation backed fluff quasi alternative. If they don't want political. There, is, there are these people who know, well, okay, all those, but where do I go? And don't tell me, Sabel, to go to 100 websites. So that is where we want to head. And that's ambitious, yes. I'm doing my part, too. I'm working easily, 70 to 75 hours a week, easily. And, and, and I'm so, a mother. So then let me close by asking our viewers to this new podcast series to put your money where your mouth might be and support the work here. Uh, we're three independent people who collaborate at BoilingFrogsPost.com and we have a similar approach, similar worldviews, but we're different and we focus on different aspects of, of things that are going on around us. And so we invite you to support our work uh, individually or at BoilingFrogsPost.com because that is the way that we can continue to do this. And your financial support is also an important kind of validation because it shows that you see a value in what we're doing. And uh, so even, you know, I, I value the people who take out a 24-hour pass at my site for a dollar because it shows that they were motivated, they wanted to uh, share in the content that was made available that way. So uh, I appreciate, James, your uh, introduction to this subject, and I'm glad that we aired it out for the supporters and the users of BoilingFrogsPost.com. So thank you all for joining us for the first episode of BFP Roundtable, and we will be joining you again very soon with another episode right here at BoilingFrogsPost.com. James, Sabelle, it's been grand. <laughs>